Lots of things to talk about. Steve, I'll be all right. Yeah, I'll just. Okay, welcome back again. I'm John McIntyre, publisher of The Spotlight, and I'll be the moderator again. All right, um, the format's pretty much the same, so I'm gonna try to shorten this so we can maximize time. We have many talks, but this time it's gonna be 75 minutes. So we're gonna go a little bit later into nine, after nine o'clock. I'm um, not gonna go over the rules, everybody understands. Make sure you silence your cell phones. And briefly, the candidates will have Three minutes opening, two minutes for a closing. We're gonna have, questions will be asked again by Michael Halsey. Same questions asked to all the candidates and it will rotate through. Each candidate will have two minutes to address the question and each of them will have one minute rebuttal if they wish. They each have one red card. Um, the timers have switched, but they're right here. And let's see, so without further ado. So on my left, is Jim Carriero. He will appear on the Republican, Conservative, and Independent lines. Um, to my first right here is Joyce Becker. She will appear on the Democratic, Independence, and Working Families line. And far right is Dan Coffey. He will appear on Democrat and Working Families lines. So with a draw, uh, Mr. Carriero will go first in opening and closing statements, then Ms. Becker and then Mr. Coffey will get the last word. That will be the opening and closing statement order. So without further ado, we will, Mr. Carriero. Good evening, my name is Jim Carriero. Um, I feel like it was just a short time ago that I sat in this position and ran for office uh, just last year and have not stopped running since that began over a year ago. Um, I'm honored to be here with you this evening and I'm excited that the three sponsors of tonight's debate are supporting democracy in our community. It's extremely important. But more importantly is that we get to know our voters and what their interests are. My contention is, is that there needs to be an awful lot more debate, argumentation, exposure of issues, and feedback from the voters. Sometimes we're gonna need to go to them to get that feedback. I've had the honor of visiting many, many homes the past two years and getting to know people that were extremely interesting. We're quite blessed to have the jobs that we have in our area and the level of experience that these individuals have brought to our community. I hope tonight that you get to see some of the differences between us, but more importantly, I hope you understand that balancing all of our interest is a complicated job. My position is the only best way to accomplish that is by balancing how we deal with an issue, how frequently we discuss it, how we pass it to the public, and how we deal with it in the end. Without further ado, I look forward to having an opportunity to meeting each one of you, and if I haven't, I can assure you that we'll find a way to do that before the end of this campaign. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Becker. Good evening. I want to thank the Spotlight News, the League of Women Voters, and the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, and all of you residents here who are joining us this evening. My first challenge will be to keep this at three minutes, a challenge for someone who was born in the South. <laughs> By way of introduction, I am Joyce Becker, currently completing my first term on your town board and seeking a second term to serve the Bethlehem community. I was born and educated in the state of Kentucky, lived in Lexington, I lived in Chicago and Boston. 
So I asked myself, what brought me to Bethlehem? Two opportunities open for my family, one in Palo Alto, California, and one in Albany, New York, at Albany Medical Center. Many days during the winter months, I must say that I wonder about life in California. At this period in my life, Clifton Park was the exciting new place to live for young families, lots of shopping with promise of growth, a tempting living choice, but I was looking for a community with strong roots. I researched Bethlehem and identified that Bethlehem offered an approachable town government, a progressive library, and an established high-ranked school system and a police force committed to community policing. Our daughter Abigail entered kindergarten at Hamagrail, Michael three years later in Slingerlands. Both graduated from Bethlehem Central High School and I'm proud to call Bethlehem my home for over 40 years. In 86, I was hired by the town of Bethlehem to assist in the forming of a new department, Senior Services. A major part of my job was to recruit and train a volunteer corps to assist with service provision. I retired from the town as Director of Senior Service, a model program serving the needs of over, older residents and families. I seem to be one of those older residents now. I've worked with eight supervisors of three different party, and I almost said afflictions, I mean affiliations through financial good times and times of struggle. I managed to keep the budget department at 1.5% of the general fund. To expand services, Bethlehem Senior Projects, and a community-based nonprofit was formed as a partnership of shared funding for programs and services. Um, I continue to serve on the boards of Bethlehem Senior Projects and the Bethlehem Community Fund, both working to improve the life of students and adults. In June of this year, I completed two terms, 10 years as a trustee of the Bethlehem Public Library, and as part of the library board, managed to keep the operating budget within the range, accomplishing short and long-term goals. I will be your community, connect, community connection between town residents, town employees, and town government. I am committed to keeping Bethlehem the best place to live in New York State. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coffey. Thank you uh, to the League, thank you Chamber of Commerce, and thank you Spotlight, and thank you all of you for coming here tonight. Many of you, like me, might be Yankees fans who found themselves suddenly less interested in the World Series tonight. I've been going door to door the last few weeks, and I'm getting a lot of dazed looks on people's faces when I say, I'm Dan Coffey, I'm running for town board. They say, didn't you just run last year? For those who don't follow local politics, as some of us do, yes, I did run last year, and thank you voters for giving me a one-year term. I finished out the last year what was remaining in David Van Leuven's term when he became supervisor. And so I was honored and privileged to start working for you 10 uh, months ago on the town board, and now I'm back to ask you to give me a full four-year term. The, even though I've only been on the board for, for 10 months, we've accomplished a lot. Most importantly, we're working on updating our comprehensive plan. Our comprehensive plan was first passed in 2005. It's now going to be 15 years old. It's supposed to be a forward-looking document. So most importantly, uh, we're looking at getting that rewritten. We had seven community forums this spring in all different hamlets in town. We've appointed a citizen advisory board and that board is gonna hire a consultant and we're gonna move next year into the writing phase of it. I believe my background as a town board member and formerly on the ZBA uh, as the chair of the zoning board uh, and uh, the planning board as well as being an attorney by day gives me a good background as we get into the uh, next phase of the comprehensive plan update. Last year, uh, when Jim and I debated, we talked about the need for an open space fund. Well, we've done that. We've set up a farms and forest fund. And the biggest issue that we face as residents is we have a, a beautiful town and every developer wants to come in here and develop on every nook and cranny. We need to give the town weapons in order to fight back. And one of those is the Farms and Forest Fund, which will give people who are under pressure to sell their property other options than just selling to developers. We also increase the Parkland set-aside funds, which are funds that, that we put on developers so that when they take away green space, uh, they have to... Uh, uh, put into a fund or set aside land so that we can increase our parkland, redevelop our existing parkland, and open new parks and trails. We've taken the first steps into um, CCA, a comprehensive uh, community aggregation, whereby uh, we can go onto the market, we can uh, get bids for our energy, and try to give you, the consumer's choices, not just national grid, but you can actually get power from other sources, save money, and move to renewable uh, energy at the same time. Uh, we've overseen the, the Parks Department. Um, they have just adopted a dogs in the park policy as a dog owner, and I can tell you, having knocked on many of your doors, I know a lot of you are dog owners, 
Uh, you can now bring your dogs to the park on leash, which is a great thing. We are finishing up a tree inventory where we're going around. We have a lot of tr uh, aging trees in town. We're going to need to take that the next step, which is what do we do uh, and try to set up a, a timetable for trying to replace some of our aging uh, trees in town. We have a lot to work on in the future. The Glenmont Roundabout is coming in next year, I'm and I hope you give me four more years to serve you. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now we go into the questions, and the first one will go to Mrs. Becker. You're going to answer first, and then everybody else will answer it. Okay. Go ahead. There are members of both parties in Bethlehem town government. Explain your approach to working with people you disagree with on policy issues, and how do you find common ground to best govern? I find common ground best served um, by dialogue. I think people want to talk to you about how they feel about their community, where they're going with their community. That's what they want to hear um, from their, from their um, town board members. Um, they want to tell you what they see, what they want to explain to you about their community. With the seven hamlets here, every community in town, every hamlet is different and has different needs. Okay, Mr. Coffey. And again, Mike, so that, if you could just repeat the question. There are members of both parties in Bethlehem town government. Explain your approach to working with people you disagree with on policy issues, and how do you find common ground to best govern? Fortunately, most of what we do at the town board level doesn't fall along the conservative or liberal spectrum. 95% um, of the votes that we've taken in the 10 months that have been on the board have been unanimous. Um, there have been times where Joyce and I have disagreed with each other, even though we're both Democrats. There have been times that uh, Jim Foster, who happens to be a Republican, disagrees. But again, 95% of the time we do agree. You go into campaign mode and you go door to door and you say why you want to run. Once you take that oath of office, you, there's 6,000 people that voted for Jim last year, but I represent everybody. So, uh, you know, there's campaigning is one thing, but once you get in office, you set that aside and you work collaboratively. And we try to work as best we can with everybody on the town board and with the supervisor to get unanimity when we can. And when we can't, and when we disagree on policy, we do so respectfully and we move on. Okay, Mr. Carrier. Having run a bank for uh, seven years of my final end of my career, uh, I had the opportunity to deal with people from all walks of life. And often, the people on the team would have very significant differences of opinion about how we were gonna serve the public. So my job was to really bring people together. It was break down our differences and find out how we could balance our opinions and work together. But if you keep your eye on the person who's paying you, which is, the, in our case, the voter, in my case, it was the depositor, you become much more successful at fulfilling people's needs. I would contend that the current board has made their decision before they walk in the room. There's very little debate, there's very little discussion, there's very little controversy. So either they have a, an extrasensory perception that's beyond belief, or they've had a, quite a lot of discussion before they got there. And I would contend that they're highly political in nature. My, also, my also view also is that I think we have to have a more vigorous, contact with the public about what policies that the town is taking on. I saw that by campaigning in spring and summer to homes and listening to what the voters' views are. So although they may know that there's gonna be change, they may not understand the implications of it. So I think we have to be much more aggressive about communicating and showing our citizens what we're thinking and what we wanna do. Parties are what we use to get through the election process. The results, though, is what you hold people accountable for. And I would contend that the results we're experiencing are really fracturing our community and that many people, at least one third of it, doesn't agree with the positions our board has taken. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Becker, would you like to respond? Do you have one? I would like to respond. The public is engaged and we give information to the public in many ways. Um, we do not um, have discussions. We receive hundreds of pages before each board meeting. Um, we study them. We look through them. They're available online on the town website for everyone to look at. The um, Bethlehem News provides people who do not have connection to the internet to know exactly what's happening in Bethlehem. 
Um, I think that, in fact, uh, Dan Coffey did just say, and it is true, that 95% of the, the vote from this town board includes a gentleman, Mr. Foster, who is a Republican, and we work out those differences. We talk them out before vote. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Coffey. Um, I just echo with Joyce, we don't talk about policy behind the scenes. That's We have a thing called the open meetings law. You cannot talk policy in a quorum. A quorum is three people. We do, however, do our homework. We get our agenda about 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. I review it. I get on the phone. I talk to department heads. Sometimes I go into department head's office and meet with them, and we discuss it. So when we come to our meeting and we come here at 6 o'clock uh, Wednesday nights, we come informed. And as uh, has been pointed out, 95% of the time, we agree. We try unanimity. Most of the stuff we, we talk about is um, approving contracts, approving uh, requests for expenses. And we do drill down. We get into the details for that. But most of the time, we're not arguing with each other. And I don't, I'm, personally don't think we want to be disagreeable just for the sake of being disagreeable. Most of the time, we want to try to work through the issues together as a team. Okay. Mr. Carriero. Well, I would suggest that argumentation and debate is healthy in a democracy. And so when I visit the people that are the voters and they say to me they don't know what the topics are, or they don't understand what's going on, or why would the town do that, that would suggest to me that there's not the contact with the voter that there should be. So an example of that, which you're going to hear a lot more about, is the road diet. Visited 84 businesses this summer. Of that group, four were informed of what the final decision was of that road diet. The vast majority of them had no idea what the choice was, nor did they feel comfortable with the outcome of the process. So I would contend there needs to be much more argumentation and debate and much more encompassment of the people that are paying the taxes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Coffey, that you were gonna start with this one. Choice and agenda, right? Then it goes to you. I got it. That's why I put them in order, by the way. In what areas is the current town board governing in a successful way and or what concerns do you plan to address? Yes, the town is uh, governing in a successful way. Uh, we have uh, our fiscal stress store score, sounds kind of boring, but it's important. We have a very, uh, we have the best possible fiscal stress score. We have a high bond rating, which allows us to borrow money at competitive rates. We have a five-year capital plan by which we look at expenses in the long run. We're not required by law to do it, but we, uh, we do it. We also do multi-year uh, planning, so the town is well run. Is there more that we can do? Yes. Uh, we have a lot of services that we're trying to get to you um, we have a $45 million budget. Every tax dollar you spend, only about 12 cents goes to the town. So you're constantly threading the needle, trying to uh, maintain expenses, uh, do the high quality services, by, but not hit you with huge tax increases. This, this year, our budget, uh, once again, is gonna be under the, the tax cap, even though we're feeling the stresses um, from, uh, from some of the strains, particularly with the advanced life support services that we're receiving uh, from the county. We're gonna constantly look for ways that we can do shared services, and I think that's probably a topic we're gonna to be talking about in a little bit. Um, we're gonna look at ways um, to always be more transparent. Uh, we web stream our meetings. For those of you who haven't done it, you can sign up for e-notifiers. So uh, Jim mentioned that people don't know what's going on in town. You can sign up to receive notifications from the town free of charge. I'm done, thank you. Okay, Mr. Carriero. So the, the facts are that you heard earlier tonight how much our infrastructure is under pressure. We have had numerous water main breaks. Last year, it was over 125, and currently we're running in the 100 nature as well. The consequence of that is that we're patching the system. So you say we have a capital plan for five years. I would say to you it's probably got to be much, much longer with recognition that we have to replace the system entirely. But because it's not a favored project, it's not recognized that's something we have to do, so we patch it instead of fixing the system. Our congressman, Paul Tonko, came out recently and said that communities are making a mistake by using the patch approach to the infrastructure. They should be replacing larger portions of the system. 
Now, it does not matter to me which political party makes that comment or the decision. What matters is that we execute on improving what we have before us. Okay, Ms. Becker. Um, I think we have a successful uh, way of, of organizing and running government. Our, we're very proud of our controller's office. Um, we have a double A score in <clears throat> the area of budgeting. Um, our town controller many times is the person called on for conferences um, and teaches other municipalities about five-year planning and the importance of long-term planning. Um, in terms of public works, we're constantly looking to public works um, to replace pump stations um, and do it on a time schedule um, that allows um, the proper budgeting for those pump stations to be replaced or discontinued. Um, also, you know, you've mentioned the road diet. Part of the road diet is the infrastructure under Delaware Avenue, Delaware Avenue belonging to the state of New York. Um, and that is indeed something that's very important is to be able to look at all that World War II infrastructure and decide what needs to replace, needs to be either replaced or to have a culvert gone, you know, through the pipe to keep that a successful operation. So there's a savings there for all of us, the taxpayers. Okay, Mr. Coff, you have one minute to re respond if you would like. Sure. Um, Jim mentioned the water main breaks. We do have water main breaks. We, we don't have x-ray vision, so we don't know where the break is gonna occur. And we certainly don't have the funds. We have 220 miles of road that we maintain. We cannot dig up every road and replace every single pipe this year. We do, however, have a plan. George Kansas, our DPW commissioner who came in a few years ago, has a plan to proactively go out there and dig up roads. This past year, one mile of road on uh, River Road was replaced. We budgeted $500 to $700,000 each year to proactively deal with infrastructure. And Congressman Tonko, if our leaders in Congress could finally get together with a bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill, as we've been told is coming, then maybe that'll give us a little money and we can be more proactive. So the congressman um, is pointing out to us that we have to take a more proactive approach. You've heard the people that we're talking about our system tonight saying that it's got serious issues. I'm suggesting to you that having over 100 water main breaks a year tells me that you're not spending enough money on the system. You see, you can't see it. So you don't, Dan, you don't dig up the whole system. You use cameras to go down into it and you determine what the issues are within those pipes. This is not terribly complicated and it's frequently done in well-managed water systems. But here, we'd rather spend $750,000 on the top of Delaware Avenue as opposed to allocating money to fix the system underneath. The, the supervisor admitted at a Chamber of Commerce um, morning meeting that there's gonna be another uh, several million dollars that have to be dedicated to those pipes underground. That's not part of the money that we're receiving from the state. So we're gonna be facing major bond issues. Okay, Mrs. Becker, you have one minute. You know, it's interesting. The Delaware Avenue um, complete streets timeline or the road diet, and there's not a woman in this room that wants to hear diet, but I will say Weight Watchers is a very effective <laughs> diet. Um, it's been, the information has been out there since 2005. Um, in 2009, um, the town board of that year passed a complete streets resolution on all road projects. So this is not a new concept. Um, most of the business owners are in favor of the change. The road is not going to change. The plan is going is it, the what will change on Delaware Avenue is the markings in the lanes. You will have one in, one out, and a turn lane in the middle. Which I think I should stop. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh. oh, wait a minute. <laughs> do, I have to, do I have to cut your mic off? Yes, you're going to okay. have to Jeez. at some point. All right. Well, the next question is going to you, Mr. Carriero. So this road diet. Hold it. You have to ask the question first. No. <laughs> Let us ask the question. You can answer it. All right. What board committees would you hope to be assigned or continue to serve if elected as a town board member? and why do you think you are or will be a positive force? Clearly the finance area. Um, having worked with governments as a government banking officer, 
Um, having dealt with, uh, been on a school board, served on a water commission, uh, I'm very uh, aware of the laws and the technicalities of dealing with finances in a community. Our bond rating, by the way, has existed for years. This wasn't recently accomplished. It's been done under both Republicans and Democrat administrations. But back to the road diet. So, Joyce, I would differ with you. The business owners did not know. And so when we visited them one by one, multiple times, they came to realize the negative impact this was gonna have on them in the construction phase and in the implementation stage. Okay, Ms. Becker. I disagree with you. There was a forum that was set up here at the town hall strictly for business owners. 13 business owner, owners attended that forum. I was here when, it, when they were asked to attend. Obviously, the information's out there. They chose not to attend, but the Chamber of Commerce ran more than one forum. I think they had two, perhaps three, um, of theirs. So I, I think the business owners do know. I think that it's going to be, I think to say it's not gonna be disruptive um, when Delaware Avenue, it, when the state of New York decides to pave Delaware Avenue. It is a longer, it is a wider stretch of highway than what you see up here uh, in near the spotlight part of Delaware Avenue. Um, I think it's something that will be well managed. I think we've learned from the past, um, the past paving in the area near the spotlight. Okay, Mr. Coffey, two minutes. So the question was about uh, board question. committees. I, I assume we're gonna get to the Delaware Avenue. That's okay. Yes. We're gonna get to Delaware Avenue in a little bit, I'm sure, um, but I'll talk about board committees. We don't have a board committee system, so we don't have committees, subcommittees. We have five at-large board members. We do everything. We do it all. So we don't have a finance committee. We don't have a highway committee. Everybody does everything. So, um, so there's, no, there's no committees that I would serve on per se, but I just want to highlight that I think my training as an attorney and also having been the zoning board chair, having familiarity with our town code and zoning code, um, I'm going to be an asset as we dive into the comp plan rewrite next year, um, and I'm hopeful that I can, that I can uh, help in the development of that, uh, that project. Okay, Mr. Carrier, you have one minute to respond. Well, the, the facts are that in visiting the businesses, they did not know. So yes, they may have been invited to meetings, but the facts are when you visit them and ask them, which I suggest you do, you'll get a totally different perspective on this. Once political pressure was applied to the situation, then the supervisor and Dan started to visit the businesses. Very interesting. Why didn't you do that before you made the choice and get their feedback? Because you had made your decision what you wanted before they had an opportunity to give you input. input. In addition to that, if you look at the list of the people that attended, they counted the garden club as a business. That has absolutely nothing to do with reality. So I'm gonna suggest not only did they miss the mark, but they've continued to, to do it. When I speak to the doctors and the nurses that work at Albany Med and St. Peter's and the Veterans Administration, they're mortified about where we're headed with the road diet. Okay, Mrs. Becker, one minute. Can you repeat the question? What board committees would you hope to be assigned or continue to serve if, was that the question? Yes, that was the question. Okay. What board committees would you hope to be assigned or continue to serve if elected as a town board member and why do you think you are or will be a positive force? Okay, um, I feel that I would be a positive force um, working with the Human Resources Department. Um, I think we heard a little bit from our highway superintendent um, about transition, transition of employees, especially where we have an aging workforce. We really need to look at transition planning with our employees. They are part of our infrastructure. Um, I would say that um, that's a committee I would like to work on. I believe um, the supervisor and I have discussed that several times as an area of large concern. Um, and as I said, we heard from the supervisor, highway supervisor uh, Tiger Anastasia about that being a problem and where he is at highway as well. So that's my plan for the future. Okay, Mr. Coffey. Uh, since Jim talked about the road diet, which is off question, but nonetheless, since this is rebuttal time, I'll, I'll just want to address some of that. Yes, I have been meeting businesses. I've been walking up and down Delaware Avenue, meeting with them. Um, 
I just want to point out this project was in the works for years. It was approved last year before I was even on the board. That having been said, uh, I've gotten up to speed on it. I do believe it's a good thing. I think the number one thing you can do as an elected official is safety, and that's what this project is about. There's been over 200 accidents on that stretch of road, and we're going to slow it down, and we're going to make it more pedestrian and bicycle friendly, and we're going to make it easier for the CDTA buses to get out of the way so that the, the uh, emergency services can, can go down that road. And yes, we're going to get down, and we're going to replace the pipes. The biggest thing the businesses are concerned about are the disruption of their businesses. I talk to them, they say, well, we don't want the construction. It's going to happen. It's going to happen regardless about how we restripe the road. All we're talking about is buckets of paint. Let's try a new way. Let's try restriping. If it doesn't work, we'll go back to the old way. But the pipes need to be replaced. I'm going to use my car. The pipes need to be replaced, and then the surface has to be redone. So let's focus on that. We don't want to redo the road, then have a water main break and dig it up. That's not how it works. So we're going to get down, fix the pipes, pave it, and then we're going to restripe it. The key thing is, and I agree that it was not handled well when we did this section of Delaware Avenue, but from CVS down to the Tasty Freeze, we need to make sure that we have a schedule, that we communicate the schedule to the businesses, and we work with them to try to implement it in such a way that we're going to minimize inconvenience and loss of revenue to those businesses. And we also need to communicate to our residences, work with the Chamber of Commerce, and let people know that they need to keep patronizing those businesses during the period of construction. Okay, well, now that we're talking about the road diet, <laughs> and such an eloquent segue, we're going to go keep going on this. So the next question, Mrs. Becker, you will start, and we'll go through. Go ahead. With the road diet coming in, knowing the hardships the businesses felt during the 2017 Upper Delaware Ave construction, what do you propose to help local businesses survive during the construction? I think we're in the process of that now by um, actively going to all the businesses. I believe David Van Leuven has spent a lot of time um, on his hoof, on his walking the streets and talking to um, business owners about the interruptions that there will be on Delaware Avenue and how we can work together to make it work for everybody. Um, if I'm going to go up to Delaware Plaza, I may choose to go at a different time of day when there isn't as much traffic there because I have that I have the ability to do that. There's no question it's going to be difficult, but I believe that we can it, it, by by working together we can make this a, a, a successful part of Bethlehem and not something to be angry about. Okay, Mr. Coffee. Um, okay, well I I just said everything. No, <laughs> I, I can go on and on about the road right? That's fine. The, the, the grants have been approved, okay? We're going to get $1.5 million from the state, $2.5 million from the federal government. This is a federal program. Just Google road diet, and you'll see it's all over the country. They find that this technology is better and safer, and the federal government is actually pushing communities to it. It was done on Madison Avenue, it was done in East Greenbush, and it was done successfully. The key is the design, as we enter the design phase, how are we going to minimize inconvenience? I talked to the hardware store. They said that they do most of their business between April and June, so maybe we can start down at the Tasty Free end uh, and move west. Uh, the beverage center says the biggest day is the 4th of July, so let's, not, let's try to work with them and try to find out when are your peak times, your peak hours and try to minimize the inconvenience uh, to that. But bear in mind, the project has been approved. We've accepted the funding, um, and it's going forward. The, the key is to uh, keep the lines of communication open and back with the businesses, with the residents, and make sure that people continue to um, patronize them. The good thing about this section of Delaware Avenue, as opposed to where we are sitting right now, is there's four lanes to work with. So we're hopeful we're going to be able to shut down two lanes, keep the traffic flowing, and then move over and do the other two lanes. Um, so uh, this is gonna, not going to start probably until 2021, 2022. So I'm going to be interested to see when we get into the design phase. One of the things when I was reading the report, they talked about connections to the rail trail. And that's something I'd like to, to talk more about. Is how can we uh, have paved pathways? So if you're on the rail trail and you want to patronize a business, we need to make those connections. And we'll get into that when we get into the design phase. OK, Mr. Carriero. So when the first part of Delaware Avenue was done, all the same commitments were made. It was a disaster. And so the store owners told me this of how they started digging up the road and it just went downhill from there. There were supposed to be four phases of this. It crumbled. It really hurt businesses. There are stores on Delaware Avenue that lost 60% in revenue. Now look, it's going to happen. 
But how you do this, we agree, has to be done extremely well. But it cannot be managed by the current people we have doing this. And we have to have a more aggressive posture about how we do. Now, what we do, you, they're describing it as lanes, as paint. If that were true, then why are we contributing to a state highway? Obviously, there's more connected to this. The road diet, by its definition, means less. It means less cars on Delaware Avenue and delay. That's going to significantly impact the people that have to use the road to go to work. In addition to that, the financial strain on us is not just what's on top and what we're getting a grant for. It's also the, the significant cost of replacing the infrastructure underneath. So there's more at this than what meets the eye. It sounds nice and it sounds reasonable. It's going to be grave. Finally, because of the delay in the road, it's going to increase the pollution that we're experiencing on that road. Okay. We have a one-minute response. One-minute response. You don't have to use that yet unless you want two minutes. <laughs> Less can be more. And I feel that it is a much wider pavement that the process of doing, it just makes sense to me, and I'm certainly not on the road cr crew, but that they'll do two lanes at one time and resurface and go to the other two lanes. Traffic will flow on Delaware Avenue. Because the traffic will be slower, I think there'll be people stopping in more of the restaurants, seeing Delaware Avenue at a slower pace. They'll perhaps do more shopping. They'll see pieces of Delaware Avenue that they fly by at 40 miles an hour. That will not be the case. They'll slow and take a harder look at what's happening around them. I would also encourage everyone to look at a part of Everett Road between I-90 and I think it's Albany Shaker. That's a road diet. There's, um, uh, there's an ears, nose, and throat giant facility. There's um, uh, an orthopedic surgery um, center. There's a Swifties, I'm so, oops, that's probably, I shouldn't ever tell you, Swifties restaurant up there. But I'm telling you, it works beautifully. The pavement is wider. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Coffey? Well, it's interesting to hear Jim Carrero say the words, it's going to happen, because last I checked, he's got a big red bus going around town with stop the road diet on the side of it. Uh, it is an approved project, and I don't think it's helpful to go around saying we're going to stop the road diet. Or uh, I think we need to plan for the worst, but hope for the best. I agree with Jim, we need more communication. I agree that when this stretch of Delaware was done, it was mishandled, and that's what uh, Supervisor Van Leuven, uh, the head of economic development, Liz Staubach, and others have been doing, is go up and down the road and talk to every business, have a schedule of construction to minimize inconvenience, possibly do construction at night, as long as we're not gonna uh, you know, disrupt the residents that live in that neighborhood. But we need to have a schedule, and we need to stick to that schedule and get it done with as uh, little disruption as possible to the businesses. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carriero. Well, Dan, I'm glad you noticed the big red bus. Um, the purpose of that big red bus is because the communication is so poor in our community. So we found a way to communicate. Actually, it was a Democrat many years ago who used the same strategy, and I thought it was excellent. So it, it's a way to wake up the community. I think it has done that. In addition to this whole discussion, though, is the fact that the people most adversely affected the citizens on the streets that lie next to, the, to Delaware Avenue, they were not aware of it either. So let me assure you, we have petitions from all those people that will be presented to the supervisor saying, we're opposed to this. And Dan, we would hope that political participation by the citizens of this community is accepted as positive and not as a threat. It's not a bad thing to have people say, we don't agree. That's called debate and argumentation. That's what democracy is supposed to be. Not that you have a meeting and you decide what's best for us and there's not input from everyone involved in the process. All right. We're going to move off the diet. So um, the next question is going to go to Mr. Coffey to start. The Port of Albany has purchased property in Bethlehem and is before the town planning board for its expansion plan. What are your views regarding developing this industrial section of town and what do you see as the impact? So uh, the Port of Albany is just on the south side of Albany. Uh, it has purchased almost 82 acres in what's called Beacon Island. Fun fact, it's not actually an island anymore. Um, Back from 1952 to 1970, Niagara Mohawk dumped coal ash there. 
And one of the issues I know Jim has talked about uh, is we need to be careful. Anything that goes into that project, we have to make, uh, be careful that there's not a disruption of the, the coal ash. There's been vigorous oversight by our town board. Um, the, one of the issues that's raised is traffic. Uh, the current plan is to have traffic go up 787. Uh, get into the uh, south part of Albany and come south on 32. However, there have been some uh, objections raised uh, that the uh, Ezra Prentice neighborhood would be affected. So that's something that is being looked at as the town board goes through the full uh, seeker uh, review. There has been a generic EIS, environmental impact statement, that was done for the project. Uh, my understanding is that the next step is that the consultant will give a final uh, EIS on the project to review it. One of the things I ran on is we need to diversify our tax base. Bethlehem is great, we've got great services, but we do need to have businesses in properly zoned areas. We have uh, heavy industrial areas like the Port of Albany that we need to welcome more businesses in. We just have to make sure that we do it in an environmentally uh, friendly area. So, and, and the, um, this is all part of the governor's uh, mandate that we are going to try to get to renewable energy, 100% renewable energy by 2040, uh, and part of the construction uh, would be making wind uh, windmills, which will be then sent down the Hudson River, not not our roads, but down the Hudson River uh, to be used uh, to generate renewable energy in Long Island. So it's a worthwhile project. Uh, the um, it's not going to come before the town board, but the planning board, I'm confident, will give it the the proper oversight that it needs. Okay, Mr. Carriero. So coal ash is highly toxic and dangerous. It's been buried on this island for a long time by uh, now National Grid. It was purchased to develop. Development is not necessarily bad, but I would suggest to you that there needs to be an abundance of caution. When I appeared before the planning board, they had no clue. There was no reaction and no clue to what I was bringing to them on two occasions. Where this went bad was in Tennessee where the coal ash collapsed into rivers that were surrounding where it was being retained, detained and retained. The result was a massive pollution of the rivers and homes and people died from this. So this is not a minor issue, this is a massive issue. All I'm suggesting is an abundance of caution. The planning board should have the EPA come in and explain what they've gone through for three years and they can't clean it up. They're really struggling with it. This is a big deal. Protecting the environment is extremely important to us. Of course we want development, but we also want to make sure we don't pollute our water. So I've asked for two things. One is that a bond, a surety bond is presented by the port that they give the town a guarantee of 125 million if this poison ever leaks into the system and is taken up by our treatment plant. Number two, is that they provide us with free water from the city of Albany. That would save us $2 million a year. So I'm, I'm suggesting that the project has to be seriously evaluated, but we need an abundance of caution and protection from what potentially could go on here and has been proven to have been a, a, an environmental disaster in Tennessee. Okay, Mrs. Becker. Well, I'm not, I, there's not enough time left um, this evening for me to talk about coal ash in Kentucky and Tennessee, so I won't even go there. Um, I will say that one of the biggest problems with the port is the proposed solution of the traffic and the truck routes. Um, there was one suggestion of using Corning Hill as, as the road for truck traffic, and we feel that that's problematic not only for the residents, but for the, the trucks coming up Corning Hill, especially during the winter months. Um, we've looked for, we want to actively look for state and federal funds to improve and to look at alternate uh, traffic patterns um, from the truck because we do think that and feel strongly that we shouldn't just uh, not, not pay attention to the port as an, industri an important indu industrial site in Bethlehem. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coffey, you have one more minute if you want to respond. Yeah, and again, I'll, I, I agree with Jim that coal ash is a concern and needs to be dealt with. I don't agree with this characterization. The planning board uh, was clueless or wasn't aware of it. There is an appendix in the, uh, the draft GEIS that discusses it. The project would be subject to DEC permitting and oversight. Um, and another thing Jim said at the, uh, the plan board meetings, I just want to correct, we do not draw drinking water from the Hudson River. I just want to be clear of that. I'm not saying we don't want to... Um, pollute the Hudson, of course we don't, but just to be clear to our residents, none of our water 
comes from the Hudson River. It comes from aquifers separate from the Hudson. Sorry, you caught me drinking. Um, Mr. Carriero. So what are the, the wells that were in contention, Dan, that are on the Hudson River that the supervisor is in negotiation to purchase? Weren't those wells taking water from the Hudson River? No. I would suggest they are. They're close enough by that they're gonna be drawing that into the system. And all I'm looking for is protections. Why would you not wanna have protections from this extreme pollutant? Okay. I'm good. All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't sure. Thank you. All right. Ms. Becker, you have one minute to respond to that same question, if you have any more. The question is about the port. No, I think I'm good. I think we've said enough okay. right now about the port. Thank you. All right. The next question will go to Mr. Carriero. Are there parts of Bethlehem you think needs more attention from the town board? If so, what are they and why? Well, I would suggest to you that um, yes, there are. And that the, the facts speak for themselves that South Bethlehem has been gravely neglected over the years as well as Selkirk. More water needs to be provided to them, more sewage treatment. These things have not been as widespread as they are in Del Mar Center and, and Glenmont. The consequence is that they need more of the services. They're paying the equal amount of assessments that the rest of us are. They deserve to have more services. Okay, Mrs. Becker. Are there parts of Bethlehem you think needs more attention from the town board? If so, what are they and why? I feel the south end of our towns felt neglected for many, many years um, by the town, by town government. Um, I don't think that's necessarily so, um, but it is a very unique area of town. 60% of the land in Bethlehem is in the south end of town. One thing I think that government could very well look at, and it would be the planning stage and the comprehensive plan, looking for more areas to define as um, areas where senior housing could um, be uh, constructed there. Um, because people in Bethlehem want to age in the commute part, in, particularly in the hamlet, that they're accustomed. And I feel that's probably what we need to do is look for areas of Glenmont, Selkirk, and South Bethlehem where we can have an affordable housing unit for seniors. I also kind of pie in the sky. I always thought, uh, wouldn't it be interesting if we considered um, um, an area in the south end of town where individuals who have uh, gone back to school, back to college, and, and they have enormous debt coming out of college could have a place where they could reside and funding, part of their rent funding would go toward their student loans. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coffey? So part of the comprehensive plan uh, update that I talked about, we had um, meetings in all seven of our hamlets and I attended all of them. It's interesting how much Bethlehem has shared values, but you go to different parts of town and they have different needs and different desires. And that's part of what the comp plan uh, update is gonna do, is try to talk not about Bethlehem proper, but each of the seven areas, because North Bethlehem, Slingerlands, South Bethlehem, Selkirk, Glenmont, Ellesmere, Delmar, we have all different uh, desires and wants. One thing that I'd like to see the town do, the, the highway department does not currently have a schedule for sidewalks. You build a sidewalk. This year we got one on Murray Avenue. 15 people come forward and say, well, when, my, uh, when am I gonna get my sidewalk? So we need to have a plan to make sure that our tax dollars are spread out among the seven hamlets. Um, and South Bethlehem, Selkirk, they're gonna lose a park. One of the things we did this year was uh, increase the parkland set-aside fees. And we desperately need to replace the park that's gonna get, uh, that got bought out by a developer. So we're looking at ways of, of doing that. Um, so um, 
again, it's just something that we're going to deal with as we uh, make it our way through the comprehensive plan to see what each area of town is. North Bethlehem, they love to have a Stewart's or a coffee shop, some place that they can call a community center. Um, South Bethlehem, um, you know, they have different needs and desires, but definitely traffic calming, uh, more sidewalks uh, are a concern there. So that's just something we're going to work through. I don't think any one part of town is desirous of more attention than any other. I have a minute, Mr. Curio. Well, I clearly do. Um, they've expressed to me as I campaign in those parts of town that they feel forgotten and lost and are quite concerned about the fact that all the representatives on this board reside in Del Mar Center. And so they would like more representation. They would like more of a voice. Is that a contradiction? I don't think so. It sounds completely reasonable to me. So what are their concerns? Well, you can't build centers, you can't build um, senior services there or senior housing if you don't have water. So there's a conflict, Joyce, with your concept. We've gotta have the services underground provided to them in order to execute any improvement. Okay, thank you. Ms. Becker, would you like to respond? I would. I think there's always a way to figure out how to make that happen. I've seen it happen here in Bethlehem and North Bethlehem. I don't agree with you. I'm sure there's an, a way to provide services to that to the area, particularly starting in Glenmont, where I believe you live. I believe you have water and sewer, and I believe that could be a starting point. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. So the person who sat, normally I sit in gym seat at town board meetings. The person who sat there before me was a guy named Giles Wagner from Selkirk. And it was the, the for 100 years of both parties, nobody could remember anybody from Selkirk sitting on the town board. And I very much supported Giles doing that. A few years ago, we had three people from Slingerlands who sat on the town board. So I don't think we need some arbitrary system that ties voters' hands that says that depending on your zip code, you get a seat on the town board. I think the way we have it now is fair, and we've made sure that we've had different people from different parts of town. And I'll point out that Mark Dorsey, our highway super candidate, is from Selkirk. So if you believe in diversity of geographic uh, on, on our town board, then, uh, then you can do that by supporting a, a Selkirk person on November 5th. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question starts with... Ms. Becker. Do you think the town is doing enough to preserve buildings, documents, and landmarks that are historically significant like those in the Slingerlands Historic District? If not, what ideas do you have that the town board can do to further encourage the preservation of its history? I strongly feel we need to, uh, the town board needs to take a lead and establish a small committee, um, perhaps of five to seven individuals, to take a look at our historic buildings and um, in Bethlehem to identify them would be a first move. And after we identify the buildings to perhaps work with that committee to work with the, compre the comprehensive plan committee to put together and identify those and how we can continue to keep them um, from being run down old pieces of property instead of something we can understand, enjoy, and learn from. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coffey? Um, I think we're doing a lot. There is more that we can do, as Joyce pointed out, uh, through the comprehensive plan update. We can look at Slingelands and other parts of town. Um, there's a church, the oldest church in town, I believe, in North Bethlehem that's in disrepair. Um, there's things that we need to do to preserve our history while we move forward. We're taking our daughter on college visits. We've been to New York City and Boston. It amazes me to see a, a church and all these skyscrapers above it. So it's something that all communities do is they preserve their past and they make sure as development comes in, they still can, can uh, keep um, uh, the, the historical legacy that they have. Uh, Susan Leith, some of you may know, is our town historian. She's doing a phenomenal job. I've been to some events in Slingerlands where you get to meet the Slingerlands family. Uh, we are um, preserving the Slingerlands vault, the important Slingerlands vault. The planning board is doing what they can to make sure when apartments come in uh, next door, it's not going to disturb uh, that neighborhood. So again, it's something that we're going to address in our uh, comprehensive update, and perhaps it's something we can do uh, when we update our zoning code as a result of the comp plan review. Mr. Carriero. So I totally agree that we need to preserve our history, and I would strongly suggest that Joyce's solution makes sense. My, con my concern, though, is that, again, here's a, a hamlet that has a need that doesn't exhibit balance within our organization. This isn't the first time we've heard that the people in that area want 
a historic preservation district that's workable and accepted. So we need to work more aggressively towards giving that. But that's what I describe as balance. There's more balance needed in how we execute policy. Would you like to respond? Mr. Coffey? Just to Jim's point about balance, so we just uh, um, appointed a citizen advisory committee to help guide us with a comprehensive plan. And we had a lot of uh, vigorous discussion. We interviewed people. We made sure that it was balanced in all sorts of respects, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, but also geographic diversity. We made sure that there were individuals from all seven hamlets that are going to serve on our comprehensive plan. So yes, diversity is important in making sure that all uh, parts of town are representative, and that is something we did when we formed the Comp Plan Citizen Committee. OK, Mr. Carriero. So Mr. Coffey, we've had a comprehensive plan in this town for a long time. <clears throat> Why is it we're waking up to these issues now? The comprehensive plan is not the solution to all of our problems, but it sounds very tight and needy. It's just perfect, comprehensive plan. Well, it's great for politicians. I don't think it's really effectively working in our town. So when I went to those seven hamlets, I went to six out of seven of those meetings, what I heard was, People were not impressed with the fact that we had limited, um, that we had a significant growth in apartment dwellings. Now, these dwellings, by their nature, are not necessarily bad, but the execution, having lived in one for 10 years, it's not a good solution. It's not where people need to live. We need to take a different strategy about housing, but apartments are not the best solution. It's intensive use of land. And it's also bringing people close together and not giving them much opportunity to live outside of that. Thank you. Yep. All right. Next question goes to Mr. Coffey. What areas should the town of Bethlehem consider sharing services with other municipalities? Um, the biggest issue we have right now is the advanced life support ALS services, um, which we share with Albany County. We spend, out of our $45 million budget, we spend over a million dollars every year to assure that our residents are, uh, have uh, emergency uh, life-threatening, um, if they're emergency life-threatening situation, that somebody will be at your door. Um, the cost is going up as the county is looking to um, hire 16 full-time people. So one of the things that uh, the supervisor in the town board is involved with, we met with uh, Craig Apple, uh, we met with other municipalities, representatives from New Scotland, uh, from the Hill Towns. We're trying to find a way that we can manage our ALS expenses uh, without, um, without soaking the taxpayers. Um, there are other areas that we have worked on and we can expand in the future. I think as Tiger alluded to, there's, high, there's, uh, there's sharing of equipment. DPW highways share equipment. We share equipment with the uh, schools. We purchase equipment using state contracts that combine accumulative uh, buying power. Uh, we buy wa water from Albany. We also sell water uh, to New Scotland. Um, and most importantly, we're looking into community choice aggregation where we would join together with other municipalities in order to give you uh, savings on your electric bill by having uh, electric companies bid to be your electrical provider. Um, We've combined highway and parks maintenance, which saves us over $2 million. Uh, we've restructured our tax collection. We consolidated our um, ambulance districts. Um, so one thing we should explore is a shared uh, animal control program. Other municipalities have it. It's something we could look into uh, sharing that uh, with them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Carriero. So shared services makes good sense. The details, though, are much more significant and have to be analyzed and studied. Again, um, you have to look at each one of these services and come up with the best solution for it and see where the cost effectiveness of it is and is it truly logical and balanced in its application. Okay. Mrs. Becker? The reality, the reality is we're already doing shared services. Um, we share highway equipment <clears throat> and staff with neighboring municipalities. We purchase equipment using state contracts. We combine our buying power. 
We're exploring new opportunities for shared services, that's for sure, with other seven municipalities to ensure that the county continues to be able to deliver the high quality emergency medical services without destroying our budgets. So we're already working with shared services. I can't think of anything else to add to that. <laughs> 